Hello everybody, this is Gary. This is um, a video I wanted to do on a preacher for something called Bright Response Ministries. Everybody who watches my videos knows that I'm an atheist. And I wanted to show you this video of this pastor that is um, a Christian version of the Taliban. He hates women. He hates homosexuals. He held, he hates atheists. He hates he hates LGBTQ people. He hates anybody who doesn't agree with him. He hates women. He's a misogynist. Um, he's a bigot. He's a racist. Um, and I just wanted to show you about a fifteen minute fifteen minute video he did on his channel called Right Response Ministries. I forget his name, I didn't bother to memorize it. The guy's a fucking idiot. He's a racist and a bigot in every sense of the word. He's a homophobe, misogynist. He holds all the views that the Taliban holds, that women are inferior, that gay people should be killed. Um, and he's just an American version of the Taliban. He's the American version of Sharia law. Um, and I just want to point that out, and I'm going to show his full video that he recorded without editing it down. I want you to see how much he hates other people. So enjoy. Hi, I'm Pastor Joel Webbin with Right Response Ministries, and this is another episode of our show called Questions. Today's question is this. How can I tell if my pastor is a coward? How can I tell if my pastor is a coward? Well, the reverse side of cowardice is courage. Courage. And courage is an interesting virtue. Uh, courage is something that just about everyone, believers and unbelievers alike, esteem and appreciate and love so long as it's safely buried underneath six feet of dirt. In other words, we really like courage long after it's dead. See, we like courage in the past. We prefer carefulness in the present. We want our pastors to be careful, not courageous. And so the first thing that I would say is pastors do struggle with cowardice. And a lot of it is because the people that pastors pastor prefer oftentimes for their pastors to be cowards. Now, they would never call it being a coward. They would call it carefulness. They would call it gentleness. They would call it winsome. If I had a dollar every time I heard <laughs> the word winsome at a pastor's conference, pastor, we just need to be more winsome, uh, I'd be a rich man. I would be a rich man. man I, Joel, I, if what you're saying, I guess, yeah, I guess that is true. But if you could just be more winsome. Yeah. There is such an attack on the truth and such an attack on any pastor with a spine and the willingness to stand up in courage for the truth that I am very sympathetic for pastors who are struggling underneath the fear of man. That said, although I am sympathetic, it is not an excuse. If a pastor is not courageous, then he needs to leave the ministry and he needs to do something else with his life. Is it hard to be courageous when you're constantly criticized? Yeah. The job of a pastor is a hard job. And if you don't want a hard job, then go and find an easy job. But don't try to make a hard job an easy job by doing the job poorly. Pastors have to be faithful. They have to be courageous. Now, that said, what's a sign? How can you tell if your pastor is being courageous? Well, one thing is to look, does your pastor preach on sin? And a lot of you guys listening to this, if you've been following my ministry for a while, you're probably going to a church where the pastor preaches on sin. All right, but for the few of you who maybe aren't, if you're going to a church and it's been months 
since the pastor has called out sin in the pulpit, uh, then you need to immediately leave your church, find a new church. Um, without preaching on sin, there's no conviction. And without conviction of sin, there can be no repentance. Without repentance, there can be no salvation. I like the way the late great R.C. Sproul said, uh, said it. You know, somebody once said uh, that God's love is unconditional. And R.C. Sproul said, no, it's not. The condition is that you repent. God loves people, um, but his fatherly love, his salvific love, is for those who believe and repent. Faith and repentance. Now, God, of course, meets this condition by giving us a new heart uh, in the doctrine of regeneration by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the point still remains. There is the condition that we repent, but there can be no repentance if there is not clear, courageous preaching on sin. So first, does your pastor preach on sin? Secondly, does your pastor preach on sin of yesterday? Or does he preach on current sin, the sin of today? Now, what I mean by that is, does your pastor, when he does preach on sin, when he is trying to be courageous, or at least look like he's being courageous, does he rail and rant about the sin that really all of the church and pretty much all of the culture at this time in 2021 already agrees is sin? Or is he willing to cry out with courage against the sin that the culture does not think is sin? That the culture would actually herald as a virtue and that even much of the church does not think is sin? Or if they do think it is sin, they think that we should be very soft and careful and gentle towards that particular sin. Let me give you an example. So if your pastor rarely preaches on sin, but when he does, he preaches on the sin of men being abusive. You should leave your church. That takes zero courage. Now let me say it again, because I know that's a strong statement. If your pastor rarely preaches on sin, and when he does, the only sin he really preaches on is the sin of men being abusive you should leave your church. Now, if your pastor preaches on sin regularly and a whole host of sins, things that the Bible actually calls sins, and one of them happens to be men being abusive, great. Because men being abusive is a biblical sin. It is a sin. But when, you, when a pastor never confronts sin in the culture or in the church, and on the very rare occasions when he does, he selects those sins that everybody already hates and despises, where there's going to be very little, if any, resistance or pushback, where, where his, his bold rant against this, this demonic, horrible, horrendous, heinous sin is really only going to cause his approval ratings to go up, that is a massive red flag. Right? So, this is what I would say. There are guys, even the Reformed Evangelical camp, which would be the camp that I am in, who are still kind of perceived by many Christians as bold pastors. And yet, the sermons that they would preach against sin typically tend to be sermons like, you're just boys who can shave. Sound familiar? Right? The sermons that are always about men and their abusive tendencies or them being overly domineering or them on the other side being apathetic and abdicating responsibility. And all those things are true and need to be preached. But a lot of these bold pastors who call out the sin of the men in their church, when's the last time you heard them preach a sermon from, I don't know, maybe the Proverbs on the wayward woman? Right? When's the last time you heard a sermon that was titled, this is the kind of woman that mothers and fathers, you need to hide your boys from. Keep them away. 
She, she lives on top of a graveyard. There are bones where she lives of all the men she's devoured. She's a man eater. She's, she's demonstrous. She's vile. She's malicious. And this is what she's like. Quoting the Proverbs, uh, her feet are swift to go here and there, but they never stay at home. She's a busybody. She's always talking with others about their business, but she doesn't mind the affairs of her own home. She's always out of the home. Right? She doesn't care to raise a family and to make her chief ministry with her children and nurturing and building a home. Uh, she, she tears down, right? The Proverbs say, a wise woman builds up her house, her husband's house. And her husband looks at her and calls her blessed. Uh, but, but a foolish woman tears down her own house. You know, there are women who want to build up the house of their husband. And there are women who, who think that's old-fashioned. They think that that's binding. They think that that's um, this enslaving tradition that takes away um, all their freedoms and all their significance and worth. And so instead, you know what they opt for? Instead of building up the house of their husband, they build up the house of another man. But make no mistake, every woman's building up the house of a man. It'd be the man that's her CEO at work. It could be the man in the White House who's pushing this liberal agenda. Or it can be her husband who loves her and cares for her. A good man and a godly house worth building up. See, there are women like that. Their, their feet are never at home. They're busybodies. They're gossips. They're the adulterous woman. Both in their appearance, the way they dress. right? Everything is, is begging for people to look at them. Right? Always wearing yoga pants everywhere, which basically means you're not wearing pants. You're just painting your legs. Right? That, that's, that's what it is. There's nothing modest about it. There's nothing godly about it. Um, that, that kind of woman, the Bible would say that that's a loud woman. See, 1 Peter 3 says that, that beauty in a woman, that's beauty in the sight of God, is a quiet and gentle spirit. It's an inward beauty. It's quiet and gentle spirit. And so by contrast, the woman who is not beautiful by God's standards of beauty, we could say the ugly woman is the loud woman. She's loud in what she wears. She's loud in what she does. She's loud in the way that she gossips, the way that she talks. She's a loud feminist woman, lion, hear me roar. She's loud, which is the opposite of a quiet and gentle spirit which is the opposite of beauty, according to God's standards for feminine beauty, which means she is ugly. So I've just done it now, right? And I'm assuming that some of you have probably already turned off this episode or you're mad at me. And so I think I've provided a, a, a sufficient example now because I've probably kind of riled you up a little bit. And so I think, I think the work is done. That sermon that I basically just preached, right? We could call it the ugly loud woman that your boys should avoid, that men should avoid. When's the last time you heard that from your pastor? Because the abuse of lazy man, you've probably heard that, that, that sermon. Boys who can, you know, boys who can shave and mistreat women. You've probably heard that sermon, right? Because the Bible addresses that and it's a sermon that needs to be preached. Because the Bible speaks to it, and men really are sinners who need the word of God preached to them to bring conviction of sin. But women are sinners too, who also need their pastors to preach the Bible to them and bring conviction of sin. So all that being said, how do you know if your pastor is a coward? Well, does he ever preach about sin? And when he does, does he preach about the kinds of sin that everybody already agrees on? Does he preach about the kinds of sin that really, if you think of sin as like, you know, like the mortification of sin, John Owen, sin is something that's, it's a beast. It's trying to entangle you. It's trying to capture you and devour you. It's, it's living. It's alive. If you think of sin like that, and you think of the goal 
The goal in the Christian life is to put your sin to death, mortify your sin, slay it. If a pastor is walking around on Sunday morning with a sword, named the Word of God, and he's poking holes in the bloated corpses of already slayed sins, slayed in the church at large, slayed in the culture at large, the things that everyone already acknowledges are a sin, right? That, that sin monster has already been slayed. And the pastor on Sunday morning just kind of puts on his armor and his breastplate and kind of struts his stuff and flexes his arms and grabs his sword, namely the text, the Bible that really does address it. And then, and then all he does is just poke holes in a particular sin that's already been slain. But then there, there's another sin running rampant in the church and rampant in the culture, devouring people's souls in the night that is alive and well. And he never even takes a swing with his sword at that monster. That's called a coward. That's a coward. And yes, I think you should leave that church. I don't think that's your first response. I think you can go and talk to him and should talk to him. So I think there are other courses, other steps of recourse that come into play first. But if that doesn't change, then ultimately, yes, that's worth leaving a church over, even if their doctrine is orthodox and sound. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch more content like this. Also, take a moment and give this video a like so that it can reach more people. And take a moment and click on the bell so that you'll be notified whenever we come out with new content. Thanks so much. God bless.